When wildland firefighters respond to a fire, they may put their lives on the line to protect our natural resources and people's property. One of the biggest risks they face is smoke, which may have both short and long-term impacts. Risks due to smoke include individual health, individual safety, and transportation safety. With proper planning and collaboration, we can reduce exposure to smoke. The goal is to ensure each and every firefighter stays healthier and safer throughout each shift, each incident, each wildfire season, and ultimately their careers. My biggest concern is, is mitigation as much as I can. I mean, it's part of the job. We're going to have to be exposed to it. But if I can mitigate it in any way, if I can ask myself, uh, before every shift, is there some way I can make this healthier on my guys' lungs? This video outlines how safety officers, logistics section chiefs, medical unit leaders, and air resource advisors work individually and together to reduce the health and safety risks associated with smoke exposure and impaired visibility on roadways. However, the information here is relevant to anyone who encounters smoke, including incident commanders and agency administrators. The video addresses the different types of smoke hazards, where smoke is encountered, indicators of smoke health effects, and mitigation controls. This video builds upon a previous video called Smoke, Knowing the Risk. That video should be viewed by anyone who has not seen it and is available on the National Wildfire Coordinating Group's YouTube channel. There are several hazardous pollutants and contaminants in smoke. Two of the hazards we know the most about are carbon monoxide, or CO, and particulate matter, or PM. Fine particulate matter are those fine particles that, that make their way into our lungs, especially, again, with long-term exposure and impact our respiratory system. They can impact our lungs and our heart, especially those with underlying health conditions. We also need to be heads up about uh, carbon monoxide. It can be produced by wildland fire smoke, it can also be produced by the tools that we use every day, such as chainsaws, pumps, and exhaust from vehicles. So we need to be heads up about that potential. And the way that we can do that is being in tune with those signs and symptoms. Those signs and symptoms are fatigue, dizziness, nausea or vomiting, shortness of breath, impaired judgment, blurred vision, and loss of consciousness. If these symptoms start appearing, it is important for firefighters to get into clear air and see their medical unit. Effects of carbon monoxide exposure vary by individual, with effects rapidly reduced with clean air and oxygen. A RAD57 device can help detect carboxyhemoglobin, a measure of CO exposure, in the blood for a person exhibiting symptoms. These measurements can aid the medical unit in making decisions on the extent of possible overexposure to CO and follow-up treatment or exposure mitigations that are needed. Smoke may also contain other hidden hazards like carcinogens, aldehydes, asbestos, radioactive material, silica, and chemicals from structures that are part of the wildfire. Human-made debris like dumps or Superfund sites may add to the dangers. And there may be unknown human-made hazards in the wildland urban interface. With all of these potential hazards, it is important to address fire personnel's health early on. As a decision maker, it is important to look for ways to reduce smoke exposure while meeting mission objectives to support this goal. So we don't want people in those locations that really have smoke set in and, and be uh, what we call uh, eating smoke for weeks on end. That's not a healthy situation. There are multiple health impacts that have been associated with wildfire smoke exposure. In the short term, smoke can cause reactions that occur immediately after exposure, like coughing, burning eyes, and a sore throat. Some people, including line-going fire personnel, support staff in camps, or at the incident command who have pre-existing health issues may experience more severe health effects and they may experience effects sooner than others. Longer exposure may suppress their immune system and may lead to airway irritation, productive cough, malaise, what's known as camp crud, and respiratory infections. That's your body reacting to an irritant, to something that's not good for you. We cough when we're in it for a reason. We get irritated and our eyes water and our nose runs for a reason because it's not good and so as time goes on that's gonna wear you down 
One of the most serious, immediate symptoms of smoke exposure is respiratory distress. Symptoms are often exacerbated for people with a history of asthma, COPD, and bronchitis. Another concern is how smoke impacts the body's ability to regulate heat. The cumulative effects of prolonged exposure to smoke may be severe and can include cancer, cardiovascular disease, and chronic fatigue. Wildfire smoke exposure has been associated with acute respiratory infections, such as bronchitis and pneumonia. There is ongoing but limited research into how the cumulative effects of smoke exposure impact firefighter health. Because of the unknowns, it's important to mitigate all the risks from smoke. Obviously, short-term stuff with, you know, uh, the ability to breathe and and uh, and folks being able to continue to do the job, long-term stuff. I mean, tons of research indicating you know cancers and and what the the PM 2.5 uh, can actually do to the you know to the nervous system and the bloodstream and all those sorts of things. So for me, uh, it's pretty concerning. Smoke hazards are often encountered on the fire lines, with some tasks having higher risk for exposure. Research indicates smoke exposure reaches its highest levels among firefighters maintaining fire within designated fire lines and performing direct attack on spot fires that cross fire lines. Higher risk tasks can include fire line construction, firing, holding, and mop up. 10 years ago, you just stood on the line and you took the smoke right in the face. Um, and that was the way you did it. Uh, and then we started to wise up a little bit and realize I can't see anything. I can't breathe. I can't smell. I'm fairly useless at this point. So now, probably like most crews, we back out into the green where we have fresh air, we can breathe, we can actually see a spot fire. Smoke is also encountered during transit to a wildfire and in camps such as spike camps or incident command posts. Smoke hazards are also present at prescribed burns. Got you. Key indicators for the presence of smoke hazards include visible smoke, reduced visibility on roadways, air monitoring information, observations of the situation by personnel, and personnel exhibiting symptoms. Once personnel are exposed to CO, they're susceptible to more exposure, and it takes time to recover. When a couple of people start to show symptoms, there are usually more problems coming. The 2020 and 2021 season required fire operations to prioritize the prevention and spread of COVID-19 while still operating in a high-risk environment. The Fire Management Board's Medical and Public Health Advisory Team still recommends strategies to prevent all infectious disease in this environment. Prevention and mitigation measures for infectious disease include practicing a module as one approach, supporting more spike camps to disperse fire personnel, and relying on remote units and virtual technology for communication. Mitigation measures are the first line of defense to protect fire personnel from wildfire smoke. There are four categories to mitigate the risk. Administrative controls, engineering controls, personal protective equipment, and planning. Administrative controls are changing how people work to reduce exposure. These include actions like rotating personnel to limit exposure and sending at-risk personnel to locations with clean air when possible. For example, hotels to get out of the smoke hazard. When high smoke levels are forecasted on the line or even in camps, it's important to make sure everyone is aware of the potential health risks from smoke exposure and highlight the possible additional risks that may be experienced by those who are pregnant or with pre-existing health conditions, such as someone with asthma, heart issues, or is older. But that's when we talk about we rotate folks in and out. We try to find pockets of uh, a good clean air where we can get the guys and get them, some, get them a, bre a break. Um, it, rather than being in that one uh, air specific area where it's really thick and nasty smoke all the time. Engineering controls include understanding the level of smoke through monitoring and making clean air filter systems available in rooms at ICP in high smoke areas or using mobile sleeping units that can provide clean air. Recently, some fire crews have started using drones to help mitigate smoke risk. We found that we can pull our guys uh, our holders that are out there looking for spot fires in the smoke, we can pull them off and get them into clean air and utilize the unmanned aircraft or the drones and their IR capabilities to, to look around for heat signatures and spots. Personal protective equipment, or PPE, includes items like masks or respirators. It's important to know the difference between the two and how they should be used. 
A mask, such as a surgical mask, will protect against large droplets and particles, splashes, or sprays of bodily or other hazardous fluids and can be most effective for infectious disease control, but does not provide much protection against pollutants in wildfire smoke. A respirator, such as an N95, reduces exposure to small and large particles from wildfire smoke. The filter must be effective at capturing particles through it and must fit the user's face snugly, meaning create a seal. This will minimize the number of particles that bypass the filter through gaps between your skin and the respirator seal. Before N95 respirators are used, be sure to consult your employer's policy on respiratory protection programs, and it's important to make sure everyone is informed of the respirator's use and limitations, such as the fact that N95 respirators should not be used on the fire line where arduous work could create overheating issues and that the respirator will not protect you from carbon monoxide are critical factors. And you may need to verify compliance with respiratory protection program requirements A bandana does not provide the wearer with a reliable level of protection from inhaling smaller airborne particles. It does not have a filter, nor does it fit snugly across the face to provide any level of protection against smoke. Currently, there are efforts to better understand if and how respirators can be used safely in the wildland fire environment. Finally, planning is a mitigation tool that should be used by safety officers, logistics section chiefs, medical unit leaders, and air resource advisors. Planning includes briefings, delegation, and making sure administrative and engineering controls are used when needed. Remember, different mitigation techniques should be applied for different personnel in different situations. Yep, copy that, Jesse, we'll do. Understanding the bigger picture when it comes to personnel is important. And you have to look at well, what have these young men and women been seeing all summer long and how much smoke have they been sucking. The agencies have been real good now about that third day of R&R. And I feel like if we've had a heavy workload with a lot of smoke exposure, then we put in the request for that third day to give our body just one more day to kind of clean itself up, I guess. Mitigation should begin if any of the following conditions are present. When smoke is visually apparent on roads, fire lines, and in camps. When symptoms of smoke are trending, such as an increase in symptoms or complaints. When monitoring for carbon monoxide and particulate matter show increased risks due to smoke. When forecasts show conditions will likely lead to smoke issues, or when pre planned management action points for smoke, or MAPs, are met. I mean, that's the number one priority is taking care of the folks and doing everything we can to, to kind of ensure their, their short term and long term health. So, you know, we have those discussions and, and, and let them know that we're going to do everything in our power to, to try to mitigate what we can and, and, uh, and do what we can to take care of them. We have reviewed the hazards from smoke and the mitigations to reduce risk. Now, let's look at individual roles and specific mitigation techniques they can implement to protect firefighters. We'll see the coordination that needs to take place between the individual roles for smoke mitigation. We'll start with safety officers. Safety officers coordinate with operations section chiefs, logistics section chiefs, and air resource advisors to monitor the overall operation of an incident from a risk management perspective and provide recommendations to reduce smoke exposure. For example, the safety officer will coordinate the location of incident command posts, base camps, and spike camps to ensure smoke exposure is considered and mitigated. We can't expect our our people to work on a smoky line and then, oh, go to a spike camp, and oh, by the way, I'm going to sleep in smoke too. The safety officer's local knowledge can help determine where smoke is likely to settle, and a dialogue with air resource advisors can further identify where to expect such smoke impacts. The safety officer will monitor smoke exposure during operations, especially firing and mop-up. The safety officer is on the scene monitoring personnel for symptoms and listening for feedback from people reporting smoke issues. Mitigation measures include tents with air filtration systems or sleep trailers. It's really all about lowering your body core temperature and breathing good, clean air as a uh, way of doing like a recovery on your body after being in those heavy smoke areas. A main tool for safety officers is the Incident Action Plan Safety Analysis, ICS 215A, to track hazards and mitigations. The ICS 215A helps the safety officer complete an operational risk assessment to prioritize hazards, safety, and health issues and develop appropriate controls. Safety officers should consult with Air Resource Advisor in developing the 215A or similar tools. The safety officer is also responsible for mitigating roadway smoke hazards. They are typically the person who receives reports of issues related to smoke and dust on roadways, 
which can reduce visibility, requiring response, such as lowering vehicle speeds before accidents can occur. My concern is, you know, where might that smoke start pooling? What kind of impacts may that have on, on the transportation to and from the line? Mitigation responses include identifying and monitoring impact areas, communicating impacts to resources, reducing driving speeds, placing warning signs, using water trucks on the road before heavy shift changes, and developing a transportation safety plan. Medical unit leaders are in a position to identify and treat early signs of overexposure to smoke. We've been working for quite some time now in less than optimal air conditions. And so we thought it'd be a good opportunity to come and say a couple things about smoke. If you're feeling crappy and, and it's because of the smoke or you're just feeling crappy, come on over to the medical unit. Let us check you out and get you assessed and we'll see what we can do for you. The medical unit record of issues, NFES 1615, is the standard format for recording initial patient complaints. Any patient complaint at the medical unit or on the fire line that requires further evaluation or treatment dictates that a patient care report be completed. Medical unit leaders can use these tools to look for trends when it comes to specific complaints and symptoms. Medical unit leaders have a duty to report their findings to safety. Medical unit leaders or safety should speak with the division supervisor and line safety about their concerns and to discuss mitigation. Here's an example of a discussion that could take place between the medical unit leader and an EMT and then with the safety officers. Hey, your division is pretty active, isn't it? I was looking at our record of medical issues here in camp. We've been getting folks coming in from your division complaining of eye and throat irritation from all the smoke. Yeah, our division is along the creek drainage and the smoke just settles in there. A few of the guys are starting to get camp crud-like symptoms. Okay, I'll let safety know and see what he thinks. Do you have a minute? I'd like to talk about division golf and some trends I'm seeing at the medical unit. Sure, what's up? You know how we were concerned about smoke in the creek drainage? Well, we're starting to see some trends emerge of respiratory irritation and eye irritation from personnel working out there. I talked to one of our line EMTs and he said it gets really smoked in there. If we are getting reports of smoke and health issues and they're dealing with it all day on the line, we should think about some options. We can consult our air resource advisor and maybe they know if the smoke will clear out anytime soon. Off the top of my head, we could consider rotating crews. If certain positions are getting more smoke than others, rotate there. We should make sure crew leaders are monitoring their people and crews are getting adequate rest and sleeping in clean air. Since they are close to the active fire, are there any CO issues you're seeing? No intense headaches, puking on the line, or impaired decision making? Not that I'm aware of, but we should be monitoring for symptoms. Sounds good. I'll let my line medics know they need to start monitoring people for symptoms. If carbon monoxide is detected, the mitigation is to remove personnel from the environment and get them to care until their carboxyhemoglobin levels return to normal range and their symptoms clear. A RAD57 device can be used non-invasively to check for carbon monoxide levels in blood, but an actual blood test is far more accurate. If someone is symptomatic, they are sent to the hospital to verify what may be wrong with them. The threat of carbon monoxide is real on the line, as has happened during the glass fire in 2020. The mitigation for particulate matter is similar. The only real way to help is to remove resources from the smoke environment. This could include engineering controls like tents with air filtration for sleep trailers or sleep trailers coordinated with logistics and the ARA. Administrative controls could mean rotating the resource out of the smoke environment or sending them to a hotel. Smoky ICPs and forward operating bases can have air filtration options used as well. There are also cases where smoke exacerbates pre-existing conditions, leading to the need to move the person to get medical attention. Logistics section chiefs need to take smoke mitigation into account as they manage the logistics on wildland fire incidents. They need to be proactive in considering smoke impacts and be responsive when personnel are experiencing effects. If actions are reactionary, the opportunity to be responsive has been missed. If you have folks who have a history of respiratory issues, starting to feel shortness of breath, to, to feel some of those things, they may be the early warning signs that you are starting to be impacted by smoke. Having informed discussions with incident commanders, agency administrators, safety officers, and air resource advisors results in the best placement of facilities. We identify, is the camp in the right place relevant to smoke? Sometimes it is as extreme of moving the entire base to an area out of the smoke so we can physically extricate folks from that smoke environment, particularly if, if that area is a lower area near a riparian area that tends to be where smoke settles 
as the ambient temperature cools. The logistics section chief considers inversions, down drainage flow, and low spots that could impact operations, all while thinking about possible impacts of smoke for 60 to 90 days. Recent monitoring conducted in camps is showing that placement of generators can also create a carbon monoxide risk. Placement of parking areas downwind of camp is important, especially if engine idling occurs at night, leading to carbon monoxide buildup. ARAs can help determine CO levels in the areas of concern and look to avoid such a situation from developing. Here's an example of the type of communication that could take place between the logistics section chief and an agency administrator when talking about locating the incident command post. Any questions? I understand you identified Willow Creek Bottoms for the ICP. Is that open to discussion based on a history of smoke impacts? I suppose it could be, but we've used this location many times and it's been successful. We added improvements for ease of setup. Smoke on this unit is everywhere. This landscape just has smoke when there's fire. I think the infrastructure addition makes the location I suggested on Forest Service land the simplest and best solution. This location is in a low spot in the river valley and is prone to inversion and smoke pooling for long periods in my previous experiences here. May we look for an alternative utilizing your expertise or someone with local experience based on history and smoke flow? That'll take time, and most of the sites out of the smoke will need additional support like portable cell phones and satellite equipment. Is the additional cost justified? Our team thinks so. We're learning more about the adverse impacts of smoke every day. If we do our homework on possible sites and consult with our ARA, we could give you a proposal in a couple of hours? I'm not sure I'm sold, but I think we should explore the options. The logistics section chief actively seeks smoke information from the Air Resource Advisor and the Safety Officer and stays engaged with weather forecasts to determine potential impact. This way, they can continually look for infrastructure solutions to mitigate smoke. They should also educate their staff about smoke and include them in the planning discussions. As conditions change, logistics section chiefs must implement different engineering and administrative responses. These might include requesting smoke monitoring, adding mechanical air filtration, or even building do-it-yourself filter fans, moving to buildings like a school or a community center, or sending resources to hotel rooms. All of this is based on input from medical unit leaders, safety officers, and air resource advisors. Other mitigation measures implemented by the logistics section chief include a process for addressing roadways impacted by smoke, ensuring hydration capacities are increased in smoky areas, considering hardwired or green options to reduce combustion in camps, placing generators away from work areas and paying attention to make sure exhaust is not entering a yurt or through doorways. Anticipate the need for N95 respirators and have an adequate supply ready for those with concerns. Identify people at the highest risk for smoke exposure, such as older individuals and those with pre-existing medical conditions. In situations with a lot of particulate matter, issue a notice about bad air conditions to warn people to be on the lookout for their symptoms. Air Resource Advisors, ARAs, predict smoke impacts on fire personnel and the public. They can use monitoring equipment and dispersion modeling to help identify the best locations for incident command posts and remote fire camps. They can also communicate when smoke conditions will be improving on roadways, which may have smoke issues for the public or for fire personnel. We start putting up monitors and modeling and evaluating on an hourly basis, in addition to then eight-hour averages and 24-hour averages, to kind of get a, a sense of what the cumulative effects and or if this is going to be a short-duration impact on those resources. The dispersion modeling also shows how wildfire smoke concentrations could impact roadway visibility and downwind communities. The Air Resource Advisor's modeling information is relayed to safety officers, logistics section chiefs, and medical unit leaders to help them implement best management practices for reducing smoke exposure. What we're aware of now is, is that we can make better decisions, we have less health impacts over time, and you realize that as an Air Resource Advisor, the role you play in that is to help people increase their awareness and provide them mitigation measures that they can take in order to maybe avoid the implications of long-term exposures and even short-term exposures. The following dialogue might take place with a safety officer about roadway visibility. Looking at the weather forecast and smoke dispersion models, it looks like the next three or four days we could have some heavy morning and evening smoke in Division Golf, especially on the 223 road in the Gulch. Smoke could get pretty dense there and visibility could be really compromised. The smoldering stumps along the road could make it even worse. That's the only way in or out for two divisions in that area. It's narrow and gets lots of fire traffic. Division line safeties are already communicating about the heavy dust on that section of the road. Mixed with smoke, it could make for a real driving hazard. 
The dust is a serious health hazard on its own, not just the smoke. What are your thoughts? I'll identify the dust and smoke issues in Division Golf at the Command and General Staff Meeting and document it in the 215A. I'll give my line safeties a heads up at pre-brief tomorrow morning and communicate the hazard at the morning briefing. Line safeties can identify mitigations at their division breakouts, like slower driving or communicating traffic directions. I'll also get with logistics to see if transportation has some smoke warning signs that they can set up and see if we can possibly get an extra water tender to help keep the dust down in that area. Thanks for the heads up. Additionally, the Air Resource Advisor informs safety officers and incident management teams about state OSHA regulations pertinent to the non-federal workers when smoke conditions warrant it. They will know wildfire smoke mitigation and response strategies to meet those requirements. Air Resource Advisors inform the public about smoke concerns by working with state, local, and tribal health and air quality departments. Other pollutants, such as ozone, may be present, which can make health effects of particulate matter worse. Collaboration between safety officers, medical unit leaders, logistics section chiefs, and air resource advisors is critical in making timely decisions to mitigate the impacts of smoke. That's when logistics and safety and medical really need to get together. And we need to have that conversation of, you know, what are some of the trends that we have already in camp showing the signs and symptoms of being in heavy smoke? And then also, what's the forecast going forward? The people on the fire lines should also have a voice. I mean, I think it's my responsibility from the ground level to kind of start some of those conversations uh, and, and let the safety officers and logistics folks know that, you know, you know, hey, we've been sucking smoke for, for 10 days. Uh, we need a, a real opportunity to get our folks uh whether it's hotel rooms or sleep trailers or get out of the smoke for a couple of days just to kind of let the, the body recuperate and, and get back to the way we ought, to, we ought to be. Here is one more example of how all the different roles should work together to mitigate the risk from smoke. Hello, I'm the air resource advisor assigned to the fire. I need to talk with you about the thick smoke we have been measuring in camp the last couple of nights. The monitored numbers and forecast show we may be having this impact for a while. Have you been sleeping okay with the smoke? Are the crews showing signs of any fatigue from disrupted sleep? Yeah, I've been waking up a bunch at night and have been one of the ones hacking at the morning briefing. Well, with the fire growth and fuels, it looks like we will be in the smoke for a while. Do we have any concerns we should explore further? Let me chat with medical and find out what they're seeing. I can check with line safety and see if folks are fatigued. We have some crews spiked even closer to the fire. They've been getting it on the line and in spike camp where it's even smokier. We can see if we can get a monitor up if they have power. What do you need to start the ball rolling? Well, I'm not sure there are any options. I could check with logistics if there are options up on the bench for the ICP rather than in this valley bottom. Maybe we should let the medical unit leader know about these levels in case there are folks with pre-existing medical conditions who may be more vulnerable. I also have a RAD 57 CO detector for use. Are you familiar with the device? Not really. It's a handheld device similar to a pulse oximetry device. It measures carbon monoxide in the bloodstream with a small, non-invasive finger probe. I can brief the medical unit leader on it. Starting to sound like we might want to have a discussion at C&G. I'm not sure there's an alternative for the spike camp, but maybe we can offer hotels or alternate locations with clear air and rest for folks starting to get run down from the smoke. Let's see what the monitor says and what the medical unit leader thinks. Dealing with smoke is a fact of life in a wildland firefighting environment, and it's important to consider the effects of smoke on personnel. I can tell you at 20, I wasn't thinking what I'd be like at 50. Now that I'm a lot closer to 50, I'm a little more concerned what 50 is going to look like. By working together, safety officers, medical unit leaders, logistics section chiefs, and air resource advisors can take steps to mitigate the impacts of smoke. This will protect personnel health in both the short and long terms. Smoke continues to be a hazard and concern in the wildland fire environment. This hazard has been recognized through recent legislation. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law directs the Secretary of the Interior and the Secretary of Agriculture to develop and adhere to recommendations for mitigation strategies for wildland firefighters to minimize exposures due to line-of-duty environmental hazards. The National Defense Authorization Act for the fiscal year 2023 included the Federal Firefighter Fairness Act. This legislation included presumptive health coverage provided through the Department of Labor, worker compensation for federal firefighters for many types of cancers and sudden cardiac arrest and stroke, 
In addition, it directs the Department of the Interior and the Department of Agriculture to conduct a comprehensive study on the long-term health effects that face federal wildland firefighters, those who are eligible to receive compensation for work injuries through presumptive illness coverage and experience exposure to fires, smoke, and toxic fumes when in service. We need to be smarter going forward. We need to be better educated and we need to protect ourselves better into uh, what, what do we do if we're in that environment? How do we recover from being in that environment?